Speaking of uh, overseas museums, I always remember on one of our Bible lands trips, we went to a museum and the tour guide told us in here, in this museum, you will see the severed right arm of John the Baptist. One of seven we have in this country. <laughs> and then he kind of grinned at us as if to say, don't believe everything you hear. In one of those other museums, they had a tiny skull that was supposed to be John the Baptist. And I asked someone about the size of it, and they said, well, that's because that's, that's when he was an infant. <laughs> Think that through for a moment. <laughs> there's, a, there's some of the places over, I tell you, I love the Sea of Galilee on the Bible Lands trip because you knew that was real. <laughs> And you didn't have to uh, pull up to the sycamore tree at Jericho and have them tell you this is the very tree Zacchaeus was in when he was waiting for Jesus. But there are some legitimate places and it's wonderful to go and visit, but that's not my topic. But uh, if you ever get a chance to go, I know you'd, you'd be blessed by doing so. I want to go with you though as we begin to Mount Sinai because that's where this emphasis of being a special people that are supposed to be different is found in Exodus 19 is where we want to begin today. Exodus chapter 19. And you'll know that they are just there at Mount Sinai having left Egypt. And the Bible tells us that God tells Moses to tell the people this in verse 4 of Exodus 19. You've seen what I've done unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and I brought you unto Myself. God is a gathering God. He always wants to bring us unto Him. He doesn't want to say depart. He wants to say enter. He brought the people unto Himself. And then He says, Now therefore, in view of what I've done, if ye will obey My voice indeed, verse 5, and keep My covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto Me above all people, for all the earth is Mine. You'll be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. And so Moses comes and conveys this information to the people. And look at their reaction in verse 8. They all answered and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses then returns the words of the people to the Lord. And so this idea of them being a peculiar treasure. The word peculiar here is interesting it's from a Hebrew word that means literally to be shut away or shut up. Now, I suspect that if you have something that's really, really valuable to you, you have a place for its safekeeping that's not right out in the open. You tuck it away somewhere because it is so precious that you keep it as a treasure that is locked away where not just anyone can get to it. And that's the word that's used to describe God's relationship with His people. They are so special to Him. They're a people for His own possession. And if you'll go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7, you'll notice that when God tells them they're about to enter into the promised land, He tells them, watch this, He wants them to be different. Different. Different than the people that had occupied those lands. So he mentions those people in verse 1. And then he says, God's going to deliver them before thee in verse 2. You'll smite them. You'll utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them. Be different than those folks were. Don't act like they acted. In fact, it says, I don't want you to make marriages with them, verse 3. I don't want your daughter to be given to their sons or their daughters to be given to your sons. They will twine. Why not? They'll make you different than I purpose for you to be. I want you to be different than they are, not allow them to make you different than I want you to be. And they'll turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. And the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he'll have to destroy you suddenly. I want you to destroy their altars, destroy their gods, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. Now watch verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people. But the word special here is translated from the same Hebrew word that was translated peculiar. 
back in Exodus 19. It's the very same word. You are so special to me, it's as if I've got you in a special place where you're all mine and you're not available to just anyone. You're mine. You are my own people and I love you. You're a special people. And there's a sense in which your redemptive purpose has made a relationship between you and me that puts you above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Go to chapter 14 of this same book. Look at verse 2. I'm establishing this principle of speciality or peculiar, as the word is sometimes translated in the King James Version. In verse 2 of Deuteronomy 14, and may I remind all of us that when we started in Exodus 19, the children of Israel were just getting started. By the time we get to Deuteronomy, they're close. They're this close to the promised land. And Moses is giving a series of farewell sermons. And he's telling them, he's telling them this. Thou art, verse 2, and holy people set apart. Different. You're set apart to be different. You're holy unto the Lord thy God. The Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar or special people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. So since God has a special relationship with you, you ought to act as he wants you to act. After all, he is the Lord God. Would you go to Leviticus 18 as we journey toward the New Testament emphasis on this? I'm going to let the law be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ and to bring us to the Christian age. In Leviticus 18, you'll note there that the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 1, and he told the children of Israel in verse 3, After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt shall you not do, be different than the Egyptians were. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall you not do, neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall do my judgments, keep mine ordinances to walk therein. Well, what gives you the right to tell us to do that, God? I am the Lord your God. If someone asks me what gives me the right to tell them what to do, I don't have any inherent right to tell someone what to do that's not my child, but i tell you this, God has the right to tell everyone what to do. He says, I'm the Lord your God. In verse 5, you shall therefore, the word therefore needs to be stopped and investigated for what it's there for. Why is the word therefore there in verse 5? In view of the fact that I'm the Lord your God, verse 4, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which of a man do, he'll live in them. I am the Lord. He bookends the statement, I am the Lord, so I have a right to tell you what to do. I am the Lord, I have a right to tell you what I just told you. Look at chapter 19, very next chapter. He says in verse 2, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, different, set apart, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now go to chapter 20, same book, look at verse 7. Sanctify, this is Leviticus 20 and verse 7. Sanctify means to set apart. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy. Why? Why, why should I? For I am the Lord your God. Drop down to verse 23. Verse 22 even. You shall therefore, in view of who I am, keep my stat. How many? All of them. All my judgments, do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And then verse 23, you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. I don't want you acting like those folks acted. I want you to be different. I abhorred them in the way they acted. I don't want you to go into their land and act the same way. Verse 24, I've said to you, you're going to inherit their land. I'm giving it to you to possess a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm the Lord your God, which have what? Separated you from other people. I've set you apart to be different. You shall therefore, in view of the fact that I've set you apart to be different, you shall therefore put difference between clean beast and unclean, unclean fowls and clean. You shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or any of the other things that I've separated you from as unclean. No, instead, verse 26, you shall be holy, set apart to me. 
You're mine. I, the Lord, am holy. I've severed you from other people that you should be mine. Listen, on September the 24th, 1983, I severed myself. My wife severed herself from any other person on the planet to just be each other's. She's mine, I'm hers. That was our decision and one that I still treasure to this day. God says we have a relationship where we are unlike others. We have a relationship where it's unique. And you know what's sad about this? In spite of all that God had done for them, these people were absolutely bound and determined to not be different. They wanted to be like, like who? Well, go back to Deuteronomy 17 and go over there to Deuteronomy 17. Who are they determined to be like? Not like the God who had called them into the land of liberty. No, in Deuteronomy 17, 14, God already knows what's going to happen when they get into the land. He's predicting it. Verse 14 of Deuteronomy 17, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and you shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shalt say, what will they say? I will set a king over me. Why? Why would you want a king? Am I not doing a good enough job in leading you out of bondage, leading you into the promised land? Why would you want another ruler? Like as all the nations that are about me. That's why. And if you'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 8, you'll notice the very fulfillment of this prediction. Samuel, you're old. We don't want you anymore. We don't want your boys. In fact, what we want is a king. Look at verse 5 of 1 Samuel 8. Behold, you're old. Your sons don't walk in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us. Why? We want to be like all the nations. And so indeed, God says, they haven't rejected you, Samuel, they're rejecting me. But go ahead and tell them they're going to be able to have a king. But you tell them what that king's going to put them through. And then drop down, if you will, please, to verse number 19. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no, no, we will have a king over us. We're determined to be like the nations round about us. Verse 20, that we may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel heard all this. The Lord heard it too. I want you, as we get ready to go to the New Testament, I want you to look at one last hinge that I want to show you. If you'll go back to Deuteronomy 28, and you'll look at the first two verses of this chapter God tells them, listen, I have done everything for you to bless you, and you can have blessings on top of blessings if you'll do one thing. Hearken to what I say and do it, even if it may be different than others. You do what I ask, and I'll bless you like no one else could. In fact, verse 2, he says, all the, and last part of verse 1, the Lord thy God will set thee on high, Above all nations, you'll, above, you'll be above all the nations. Well, we want to be like the nations. God says, I want you to be above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come on you and overtake you if you'll hearken to me. And look at verse 9. The Lord will establish you a holy people unto himself, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, all people of the earth will see that you're called by the name of the Lord and they'll be afraid of thee. You'll, you'll be the one. In fact, it says in verse number 12, the Lord will open to thee his good treasure. You are my treasured people. I am going to open up for you my treasure storehouse and I'm going to give you the rain. I'm going to give, I'll make you the head and not the tail. Verse 13, you'll be above only, you'll never be beneath. If you, if, 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 if you'll just hearken to all the commandments of the Lord thy God, I'll put you on a pedestal where you cannot be reached by anyone else. No one else will be able to touch you. Instead of going along with that, 
These people were going to disobey God and thus what? Verse 32 of Deuteronomy 28. When that happens, your sons and your daughters will be given to another people, and your eyes will look all over for them, fail with longing for them all the day. Where, where'd my boy go? Where'd my, where'd my daughter go? Oh, they're in foreign captivity. There, you wouldn't act different, so I gave you a different residence. You wouldn't act differently than I wanted you to act from the people, and so I'm going to, you want to be so much like these people? Fine, I'll send you to live with them. That's exactly what ends up happening. Look at verse 36. The Lord thy, shall bring thee and thy king. Oh, you've got to have a king, do you? Why? Well, we want to be like all the nations. So the Lord, I'll give you a king, but when that time comes, the Lord will bring you and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, to a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there in that different land, land different than the one I planted you in that was full of milk and honey, I'll put you in a land that will, well, you'll serve other gods there, wood and stone, since you seem to be into that so much. Look at verse 49. The Lord will bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth. Verse 50. A nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. And look at verses 63 through 68. He says, just like the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, the Lord's going to have to bring you to nothingness. He'll bring you to naught, verse 63. He'll scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other. You'll serve other gods there. You won't find any ease among these nations, verse 65. You'll have a failing of eyes and a trembling of heart and sorrow of mind there. Your very life will hang in doubt before you. In the morning you'll say, I wish it was nighttime. In the night you'll say, I wish it was morning. You'll never be happy, never be satisfied. And you had to be different. And how's that working for you compared to what it was like when you were doing what I asked you to do? How's that working for you? If you want to know how it worked for them, look at verse 68. The Lord will bring you into Egypt again. Now, he doesn't mean geographically. He means bondage-wise. Go to the book of Hosea chapter 8, and this is getting us one step closer to the New Testament. In Hosea chapter 8, this is centuries later. And what does the prophet Hosea have to tell them in verse number 14? Israel's forgotten his maker. So... What does that mean? Last part of verse 13. They shall return to Egypt. Not literally, geographically, but uh, thematically. They're, they're going back into bondage. Next chapter, Hosea 9.3. They won't dwell in the Lord's land anymore. No, the land I gave you, you wouldn't listen to my warnings, and so you wouldn't live differently, and so now I've got a different destination for you than the promised land. It's going to be land of bondage. Ephraim will return to Egypt, but notice he's obviously not talking about Egypt because he says they'll eat unclean things in Assyria. You're going the northern kingdom, and Hosea is the prophet of zero hour. You're going to go into captivity, and when you do, and you're, you're this close to going into captivity right now, we've been warning you and warning you, you wouldn't listen, and so now it's time. You're going into captivity Chapter 11 of Hosea, look at verse 1. Israel, you know, when you were a child, I loved you. I called my son out of Egypt. And look at verse 3. It's so tender. I taught Ephraim to go, taking them by their arms. I can remember, as you can, taking your small child. They're just learning to walk. They put their arms up in the air so you can, standing above them, hold on to those arms stand behind them, and then they start taking those first steps, and you're there to help make sure they don't fall, and you're there to, as a safeguard. Then you let go to see if they can make it, and they, they get a little ways, and then they start stumbling and falling. It's a tender, tender moment. You teach them how to walk. God taught Israel how to go, and what did they end up doing? They grew up and rebelled against the very one that loved them so. And notice verse 5 of Hosea 11. 
he won't return to the land of Egypt geographically, but the Assyrians shall be his king because they refuse to return. Chapter 13, 4. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. You'll know no God but me. There's no Savior beside me. Think about our relationship. I knew you in the wilderness, verse 5, in the land of great drought. I gave you water. I gave you food. I kept you alive. And what did you do? Verse 9, Israel, you've destroyed yourself. But I've got good news for you. In me is help. If you are looking for help in a way, I, I, you wanted a king so much, verse 11, I gave you a king in mine anger. I took him away in my wrath. And so now what? Now we look to the New Testament. Do we have a king today? God took their king away, but did he give us another one? I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, if you will, please. 1 Peter chapter 2. And here we find a lot of what we've just seen in the Old Testament all dovetailed together to merge here in this great text of Scripture. Does God expect His people today to live differently than everyone else does? Well, He certainly expects us to live differently after we become Christians than we did before we were. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. You need to lay aside all malice all guile, hypocrisies, envies, all evil speakings. You don't talk the same way that everyone else talks. You don't act the same way that everyone else acts. No, you grow like a newborn baby who is getting stronger and stronger. Verse 5, you're built up a spiritual house. Living stones is what you are. You're a holy priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And look at verse number 9. You are what? What are they? A chosen generation, a royal. You have royalty, yes. Royalty in the sense that you're connected to a king, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar, there's our phrase, a peculiar people. Now what did God expect His peculiar people of the Old Testament, His special people of the Old Testament to do? To act differently and to reflect His glory and to show forth His praise by the way they acted and the way they conducted themselves. Uh, They didn't want to do it. They wanted to be like the nations rather than like the God who delivered them. And so today, what do we face? The challenge. Are we going to verse 9, show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light, out of bondage, the bondage of sin. In times past we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. And we had not obtained mercy in the past, oh, but we have now. And, and so what's the expectation? Verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So why do we act different? Because we act differently because we are different We have a different purpose, a different king, and we follow after his guidance and his will. I want you to please notice, thus in chapter 3 of 1 Peter 3, how do we act? Not rendering evil for evil, no. Instead, verse 8, we're of one mind. We're, We're compassionate people. We love his brethren. We're full of pity. We're courteous. We don't render evil for evil. We don't rail for railing. We, we give blessings rather than cursings. And we love life. And we see good days. Because why? We refrain the tongue from evil. His lips don't speak any guile. We eschew or turn away from evil. We do good. We seek peace and ensue it. And God hears us when we pray. Don mentioned it. And I just mentioned it last week at camp when I was teaching some young people. I was trained by good godly parents. But there was a time in school when I started acting out. I thought, uh, if I'm going to be popular with this group, I'm going to have to be like they are. And so I have to talk like they talk. Act like they act. Think what's funny that they think is funny is also funny. I'm going to have to be more like them. 
Now, friends, if you don't believe we still have that problem in our world today, ask yourself why so many celebrities who have no education at all in medicine, no education at all in any fields of science or anything of that nature, who don't know anything about the truth, are followed by so many followers on Twitter and Instagram and other social media platforms. Why do they have millions and millions of people who hang on their every word and want to be just like them? Because we've missed the memo that we're supposed to get, and that is God says, I don't want you to act like those folks are acting. Truth be told, how many of those folks are truly, truly happy? You tell me. When I was preacher at South Haven, I mentioned an interview conducted with Elvis Presley in which Elvis said, quote, sometimes I believe I'm the most miserable man on earth. And the reporter's like, come on. <laughs> You're miserable in your 20 plus room mansion with all of your gold and platinum records on the wall and everyone who thinks you're just outstanding and adorable, all those beautiful women that would love to be your girlfriend or your wife, and you are miserable. Yeah, a lot of guys would love to trade their misery for yours, Elvis. So I tell this story, and I don't think anything else about it. And then I go visit a couple that came to our services that morning that had never been there before during my time as the preacher. And when I knocked on their door, they were very enthusiastic to welcome me in. And they said, we had not been to church in 17 years. And the first Sunday we go back, you preached on Elvis. Wasn't that amazing? It was amazing. I didn't think I'd preached on Elvis. I told one thing about him in a sermon on 1 Timothy 6, 7 to 17. We brought nothing into this world. We're carrying nothing out. I said, why did it amaze you so much that I mentioned Elvis? And she said, oh, Gene here, he's Elvis's first cousin. His mother and Elvis's mother were sisters. I married Gene, so I married into the family. And Gene and I used to live at Graceland with Elvis. We lived in the upstairs part. I've never met these people before, okay? So will you forgive me when I tell you that in my mind I was thinking, what kind of Looney Tunes have I run into? Bless their heart, they think they lived at Elvis's mansion. These people are obviously not grounded in reality. I'm going to get out of here pretty quickly. But then they pull out the photo albums. Here we are with Elvis on the set of Jailhouse Rock, and here we are at this holiday party, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gene says, You really took me down memory lane Sunday morning when you mentioned that interview. I said, Why is that? He said, I was in the room when it was conducted. Elvis would allow us to be there if we didn't interfere with his, you know, interview. But uh, we, we were listening. And when the, the interviewer heard Elvis say that he thought he was the most miserable man on earth, he says, you have no idea how he tried to get him to take it back. I'm here to write a puff piece about how great it would be to be Elvis. And you're saying you're miser one of the most miserable people on the planet? He thought... And a lot of people think, oh, if I could just be like that person, I'd really be happy. Solomon could have saved all of them. He could have saved Elvis and a whole bunch of other folks a whole lot of trouble by saying, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and it ain't what it's cracked up to be, right? As I close out, I want to go to Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. Here we have the grace of God. Bringing salvation and appearing to all men. Teaching us something. What does grace teach? It teaches that, notice, if we're going to say we're peculiar people, we've got to be different. Whereas other people might pursue ungodliness and worldly lusts, we deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. So there's a leaving of those things. But then notice there's not just a leaving, there's a living. How should we live instead? If we're different, how should we? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So there's a leaving, there's a living, and finally there's a looking. What are we looking for? We're looking for that blessed hope 
the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm looking upward for him to return. He gave himself for you and for me, gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and what? Purify unto himself a peculiar people. People for his own possession. He bought us. Zealous of good works. One of my favorite little stories to tell, I'm not original with me, I can't remember which preacher I first heard tell it, but I've always remembered it. This little boy, he made him a boat. He made it with his own hands. He took the kit, he made the boat, and now he's got to test it and see if it's seaworthy or pond worthy or creek worthy. So he takes his boat and he puts it in the creek and the creek's moving more swiftly than he realizes. And that boat, sure enough, it's sailing all right, but it's sailing swiftly away from him. And he runs and runs and runs to try to get to it before it vanishes out of his sight, but he, he can't do it. It's gone. What he created is now no longer in his possession. He's heartbroken. He's walking downtown sometime later and notices there in a pawn shop his boat, unmistakably his. That I made, I would recognize that anywhere. I built that with my own hands. I did that. I built that. He goes inside, tells the owner that that boat in the window, it's, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I, I made that with my own hands. And he says, sir, young man, anybody can come in here and say that. Uh, if you want that boat, you're going to have to buy it. So he goes home. He breaks open his piggy bank, takes every dime he has, and he runs back to that store, and he puts that money down there, and he purchases what he made earlier he's willing to purchase it for it to be his own possession again and as he's walking outside clutching that boat to his chest he's heard to say my boat my boat my little boat you're mine you're mine you're twice mine for i made you and i bought you and as you stop and think about it god made man and then bought him with the blood of his only begotten son. That's special. We are people for God's own possession. A special treasured people. He treasured us enough even when we didn't deserve it. To let his son bleed out for you and for me. And so is it fair for him to ask me to live differently than the world lives? Yes. And so maybe you've been doing that fantastic. Maybe you're here today and it's time. For you to say, I should have been living that way. I used to live that way, but now, I, frankly, I'm, I'm living to try to please everyone but the one who's liberated me from bondage. I need to go back to the God who set me free from bondage, the one who purchased me and made me his own. I need to go back and say, God, I give myself back to you. I'm going to live for you again. If you're already a child of God and wayward, then... Please fix that. If you're not a child of God and you'd like to become purchased by the blood of Christ, won't you do that without delays by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of sins? God wants to purify you and make you his own. Won't you let him or won't you come back to your maker, your creator, your redeemer? As together we stand and as we sing, won't you please?